An early biofeedback pioneer, Dr. Budzinski, developed several biofeedback devices, including the first digitally quantifying EMG, as well as the Twilight Learner. In 1972, he launched the first biofeedback practice in the world and was elected president of the Biofeedback Research Society in 1974. A noted lecturer and workshop leader, Dr. Budzinski has traveled throughout the United States and to Europe, Australia, and Canadian cities to speak on behavioral medicine, stress, pain, and biofeedback. He has numerous publications and has developed a number of noted and best-selling audio cassette tapes. He is presently president of Heist Enterprises and behavioral medicine coordinator at St. Luke Medical Center in Seattle. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Budzinski. Thank you. I'm uh, Tom Budzinski, and I've been asked to talk about some chronology in the EEG biofeedback area. And I go back a long way, and so I'm going to take you back with me and talk about some of those early days and bring you up to date to the very uh, new and avant-garde stuff that you heard about today with uh, Dr. Len Oakes. And I think that represents about the, uh, the top of the line with regard to new research in that area. So let's uh, turn on the slide projector back there, Alex. And, uh, I'm going to go back a, a ways to see what people did in the old days to produce altered states and the type of learning that, uh, that influenced people. This is one of the beautiful cathedrals in Europe. And I was very struck by the uh, design of the churches there, and especially the rose windows, which were incredibly beautiful. And I was told that these windows often were designed by nobility, uh, not particularly by the craftsmen that actually did the glasswork, but by uh, knights and noblemen who took it upon themselves, since it was basically a Catholic-oriented tradition, to try to produce a kind of altered state uh, in the worshiper uh, that would direct him upward uh, in his thinking to the uh, higher power. This is another one of the beautiful rose windows uh, in Europe. I used to teach a course in which we would show a series of rose windows at the same time we would play classical music and the interesting thing about that is that it would take people into a very nice altered state as a result of watching a series of these rose windows. And it was a very pleasant class and uh, enjoyed that very much. That was back in the days when you can do things like that and people actually would pay money to come and, and see you do a, a workshop like that. In 1973, in Montreal, Canada, there was a very intriguing conference called Transformations of Consciousness. It was a little bit ahead of its time, and there was supposed to be a, a very nice book that would come out on that conference, and it never did, because they couldn't get a publishing company to really buy the idea of these very new things that were being proposed. And some of them were the Julian Jaynes concept. Those of you that read his Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind might remember that. He presented at this conference, and his idea was that we developed uh, our present kind of left brain oriented consciousness about uh, five, six thousand years ago. And before that, um, we were perhaps, as we would say now, may, maybe totally right brain kinds of individuals. We made decisions in an intuitive kind of way. And uh, Julian. Uh, was very struck by some of the new work that Joe Camilla was reporting and myself and I was reporting on our first studies in, in Twilight Learning at that conference. David Gallen was there and he was talking about the interesting new work uh, being done in San Francisco and uh, with the split brain uh, ideas of Roger Sperry. Um, and Gallen was the one that proposed in a beautiful article in the Archives of General Psychiatry that in fact, the right hemisphere of the brain seemed to have all of the characteristics of Freud's unconscious. Um, this was a very pervasive idea through the 70s and, until it got 
adopted by the lay public. Now, anything that gets adopted by the lay public has a way of turning off scientists. And so they immediately turn back on this concept and begin to attack it like piranha with a fat cow crossing a stream. And so they, they just about ate up all of uh, brain lateralization and by the uh, 80s. And, uh, uh, but it is a concept that I find extremely useful still today. And um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. The other thing that happened about 1972, 73, is I went to Europe. Uh, Elmer Green was supposed to present biofeedback behind the Iron Curtain at Erfurt, East Germany. They were having a uh, conference on psychotherapy there. And Elmer couldn't go, so he called me and he said, would you like to go and present this, the case for biofeedback? I'd never been to Europe, much less behind the Iron Curtain. But I thought it would be a grand adventure. And so uh, I had been corresponding with a man named Lozanov also. Uh, he, he was doing super learning, or they called it suggestology. And um, not, not knowing my geography very well, as most Americans don't, I thought, well, I'll just go to Europe and I'll go visit Lozanov at Sofia, Bulgaria. Not realizing how awfully far it was from Erfurt, East Germany, down to Sofia, Bulgaria. So I got to the conference. It was not easy. Uh, I had to take trains out of Munich and stop, make four different stops, and the trains changed a little bit. And, and I knew only a few German words, but I, I learned how to trust people real quickly, and particularly students. And the students never steered me wrong, and so they, they kind of took me by the hand, put me on the right trains, and got me to Erfurt. When I got to Erfurt, however, I didn't know where the hotel was, and so I went into the nearest hotel to the airport, or the train station, and uh, it was a very busy lunch counter, and there, a uh, lady behind the counter was waiting on about 10 different people at once, and, and I raised my hand, and she came over, and I asked, do you speak English? And she said, yeah, a little. I said, um, do you know where the such and such hotel was? And, and she said, oh, sure. And she took her apron off, came around the counter, let everybody wait, and took me by the arm, took me three blocks down the street, and right to the hotel. And I thought, by golly, you know, these, uh, uh, these uh, people behind the Iron Curtain aren't so bad after all. And I had a marvelous, marvelous time. Well, one night, uh, they, they had a social event every night, which is what I really enjoyed about the European conferences. And, and this particular night, it was an event in, a, in an ancient castle, and, and uh, they had somebody playing Mozart on a harp, and uh, they were showing people the beautiful paintings. There was a tour, and then we had a buffet dinner. And as we sat down, or we had to choose a little table set for four, and, and my guide and I, or my translator, uh, uh, spotted an, an elderly, or seemed like an elderly man, and a, and a very beautiful young woman over at one table. And so we went and sat with them. And I found out that they were Bulgarian and probably didn't speak any English. And so he and I just conversed in English, and these people continued on in Bulgarian. And at one point I said that uh, to my guide, I said I was sorry that uh, Sofia, Bulgaria was so far away because I would have liked to have met Lozanov. Uh, since I had been corresponding with him, and this man sitting right to my left said, I am Lozanov, and I speak English. <laughs> and there he was, right there. <laughs> so uh, we had a marvelous evening uh, discussing uh, brain waves and suggestology. It was a, a bit halting, and he really hadn't done that many studies with EEGs, but he had some ideas, and his idea was that Probably when people did the suggestology programs, they got into alpha and perhaps a bit of theta. And as it turned out, he was probably right. Um, so that was, a, that was quite a thrill to meet, to meet Lozanov. And later he came to the United States and participated in a conference about 1975 in Los Angeles. This was a conference on, uh, I think they called it, they might have called it suggestology. I don't think the word super learning was around yet. Um, it drew almost 1,800 people, and nobody in LA knew what it was about, very few. But that was a remarkable thing about accelerated learning in those days. It just captured the interest of people in the mid 70s. And Lozanov came and spent the whole morning talking about his background such as I'm doing today. <laughs> and by uh, the end of the morning, people were ready to lynch him because they hadn't said anything about the process that he was doing. And so they, uh, the people as a, as a whole, you know, 
they, they paid good money to come and hear this wonderful fellow from behind the Iron Curtain. So he did spend the afternoon talking about his, his research and, and what he'd found and uh, spawned uh, a, a lot of interesting little groups, including SALT, that started. You may have heard about SALT, this, what is it, Suggestive Accelerated Learning Technique, which is a group in the United States that does a lot of that right now, today. Um, my role in that conference was to present a brain model that might explain what super learning was all about, and that's, and that's what I did. I had the easy part of it because I didn't have to uh, give any research or anything, but just, just talk in general about the new theories of the brain. So let's go down through some slides, and is there a, uh, yeah, I guess uh, we're going to have the tops lopped off, but if there's anything important on the top, we'll let you know. 1977 article in Psychology Today that was on twilight learning. And twilight learning was something I was experimenting with in the early 70s because we had been working with a number of depressed people. And the new technique known as, later to be known as cognitive therapy, didn't have a name yet. And so they would give people positive things to think about. Joe Catella was pioneering this in Boston. And uh, if the depressed person could think about these enough times during the day, then maybe he would not be so depressed. It was like power of positive thinking. So we tried it with our patients who were depressed, and a lot of them came back and said something like, you know, I said that positive thing, but then a little voice said, like hell you are. <laughs> and, and it just wasn't taking with most of these people. So I wondered if we could somehow find a way to get around the little voice. And uh, so that's how we came up with Twilight Learning. But first of all, let's go back to this diagram because this is what led us uh, into studying the different aspects that make up Twilight Learning. When we analyzed all of the different procedures through the ages that seemed to impact very powerfully on individuals, and I'm not talking about classroom situations, there seem to be these characteristics. If you look at the dashed lines, the first one over to the right has, goes from low to high. It represents the total range of cortical arousal from coma to extreme agitation where you just can't move, you're just frozen with fear. The next one over in the middle is a slightly uh, shorter line and it's the right hemisphere of the brain or the non-dominant. And it has a, an arousal level which is has a wider range than does the left hemisphere. Uh, the left seems to be specialized for lots of things, but it can be knocked out more easily by high or low arousal. Uh, for example, if you use revival meetings or primitive ceremonies or extreme danger, you can raise cortical activation to a point um, where the left brain simply doesn't function anymore. You've, you've all experienced that. Frozen on a test, test anxiety, you can't think of a thing. Uh, you go up to make a speech and, and suddenly everything goes blank. You know, that's an example of that. Extreme danger, you don't remember anything afterwards. And you say, I don't know how I did it, but I did something. Um, that's an example of, of information getting into the brain when the left hemisphere is unable to function very well to process it. So what is left to process that information? Well, we conjecture that the non-dominant hemisphere does this. There's some real hard data backing this as well from vigilance studies in, in England. And what that showed was that if you, if you give the brain uh, targets to look at and you put them first just in the left brain and then just in the right brain, and you just do this over a long period of time, the left brain is 100% identifying the target, never misses a single one of these things that come by at random intervals. 